So it's a real pleasure to be here for the very first time in this uh, beautiful place. So thank you for your invitation. And uh, thank you also for your generosity, because uh, to be a neuroscientist and to give a lecture uh, before such a distinguished audience in a completely different field from mine, that's real generosity. So um, this makes this also a very exciting thing for me. But I hope you will see during my lecture that uh, there are crossroads, there are there is an interconnectedness between what you are doing and uh, what uh, KI and uh, we are doing in terms of our research, and not least in terms of how we try to educate a new brand of leaders for tomorrow that have to grapple with the increasing complexity of the health challenges. So um, again, I'm very grateful for the invitation to come here. So. The first slides show some of the connections, in fact, between Karolinska Institute, uh, this place, the research that is being carried out here in France, and uh, also a connection with a topic at hand during this meeting. So this is from Karolinska Institute. It's one of the auditorium in uh, Karolinska Institute, 2008, Nobel Lectures, honoring the discovery of two very important viruses, obviously. So uh, I hope it's okay that I start with this uh, flashback to 2008. I would like to uh, present you with another flashback from the misty past of my childhood. This is another Nobel laureate, this time Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, Martin Luther King. And he gave a speech in the auditorium in the University of Oslo in 1964 when he accepted the prize. And just after having accepted the prize, he gave this speech on one of the major challenges of the time, inequity in health, and just inequality in health. And he said that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman. We should wonder what would he have said if he was here today or living in the world of today, seeing that we still grapple with the challenges of health inequities? I think he would say that uh, there is still much to be done. And uh, my fascination and interest in the field of health inequity has brought me to many places on this planet. And I must say that uh, the eye-openers you can get when you travel around in terms of health, health inequities. These eye-openers are formidable. This is just one example of the health inequities that um, is prevalent in the world of today. Two out of three persons on this planet have no access to safe, affordable surgical and anesthesia care when needed. I wonder what Martin Luther King would have said if presented with this figure. This is from 2015. There has been progress over the last few years, but not very much. Another very important uh, paper that came out just a few days ago, just before the weekend, in fact, was a reassessment of the burden of disease, the global burden of disease. And uh, I should say that uh, we should be attentive to the rapid development of uh, new challenges when it comes to the global burden of disease. The global burden of disease is changing rapidly, and we as universities and uh, we as researchers, we have to be attentive to this. When we educate the new leaders and also when we prioritize our research and our attempts to uh, promote global health. In this particular paper that came out, as I said, on Thursday, I think it was, it stated that cancer and other non-communicable diseases are widely recognized as a threat to global development. And in fact, I emphasize again the crossroads, the overlap between the challenges that we see within the realm of infectious diseases. 
So this is the essence of this paper. In many curriculum, in, in many curricula, in many universities, we still have this perception that the global burden of, of disease is more or less like it was in 1990. But look at the changes from 1990 and even from then uh, 2007. Neoplasms, cancer, is moving upwards to be one of the most fundamental health challenges on the globe, taking now second place when it comes to the global burden of disease. And there is inequity. If you go into the figures in this paper, you will see that the affluent countries, the so-called SDI top countries, they have about 50% of the world's incidence of cancer, but only 30% of the deaths from cancer, showing draws inequities when it comes to the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. And this is another example from earlier this year. The global syndemy, the global syndemic of obesity under nutrition and climate change. We have increasingly to see health going into other sectors than those that we traditionally discuss when it comes to health. Health is increasingly coupled to uh, climate, of course, to uh, economic sustainability. We have to see health, not only in the health sector, but in sectors beyond. And again, out of a perspective of inequity, what this paper shows, and what we now know, is that not only, have many, not only is it so that many countries have a double burden of disease, obesity and undernutrition going hand in hand, so to speak, but there is a triple burden of disease because climate changes impact first and foremost, those countries that already have this double burden of disease, obesity, undernutrition. Countries that have low or middle <coughs> income status. So we, ha we have tremendous changes in front of us. And we have to see the connections, not least the connections between infectious diseases and NCDs, non-communicable diseases. So this has been an interest of me personally, but also now a focus of Karolinska Instituta, how to understand in more detail how these inequities in health, how these unjust inequalities arise, and how are they propagated, and what could we do about them? So I was chairing a Lancet Commission um, a while ago, where we looked into the root origins of health inequities in the world. And uh, one of the obvious conclusions is that if we are to rectify these differences, these uh, inequities, we have to go beyond the health sector to find effective solutions. And this, I will come back to that later, has obvious implications for our education. We have to educate physicians, health professionals, the leaders of tomorrow that can do exactly this. See health in a broader context. Because it so happens that when we approach and in some cases transgress the planetary boundaries, health is becoming increasingly more complex. It goes into sectors beyond the health sector. So in this Lancet Commission, we came up with a set of conclusions that tells us in no uncertain terms that there are dysfunctions when it comes to our global governance systems. Global governance is not up to standard when it comes to the necessity to handle the challenges that we now see in global health. One important thing, this is just a few of the conclusions from this commission, we have to grapple with the challenge of there being commercial determinants of health that very often steer attempts to uh, improve health to arenas that perhaps are not those that should really be prioritized. Health is very often subordinated to economic goals, all this we know very well. There is a problem, of course, with high cost of medicines. And one very important thing that uh, I must say was uh, a shocking experience to many of us in the Commission, was that uh, many countries are struggling with the policy space for health. 
What does that mean? Many countries are not able today to really protect their population's health because, for instance, there are trade agreements that preclude them from putting warning labels on unhealthy food. So, in fact, one of the basic principles of the nation state is that it should protect the health of its population. But many nations are not able to do so efficiently because of trade investments, trade agreements, transnational companies overriding, in fact, the need to have ample policy space for health. We also talk about stick institutions and not least access to knowledge. And one of the things that uh, I really think that we as a scientific community should uh, work for is to uh, ensure that the research data that we are publishing, all the new information that is coming up is disseminated to all parts of the world, regardless of economic prowess. This is not the case today. So uh, open access, open science, very, very important issues in order to meet the challenges that we see today when it comes to health. So health is increasing in complexity, as I said, as we approach and transgress the planetary boundaries. So in many ways, this particular Lancet Commission was a prelude, or one could say a sort of introduction to what came in 2015, namely the Sustainability Development Goals, UN's Agenda 2030. And uh, of course you're all aware of UN's Agenda 2030. You all re represent countries that have signed onto this uh, agenda and promised to deliver on the milestones, the goals, the ambitions of this particular agenda. And uh, the complexity is enormous. And we are just about 10 years away from 2030. How should we possibly deal with all these challenges? One important issue is that if you read all these 17 different goals, you will see that health is very much in evidence in all of them. Health pervades all these different challenges that are embedded in Agenda 2030. It has to do with clean water, it has to do with climate, obviously. It has to do with poverty, indeed. So this, again, tells us that we have to look at health in a much broader context than before, when it comes to research and not least to education. So, in fact, inspired by these goals, we at the Karolinska Institute, uh, we developed a new strategy plan as of this year. And, uh, well, what did we choose as a time perspective? Obviously, the same as UN's Agenda 2030. Simply to make this connect between UN's agenda and our own strategy and our own education and research. So our new vision is that, uh, yes, we are advancing knowledge about life. That's very much the basic science. And we will continue to have a strong profile, obviously, in basic science. But we should also, as it says, in the second half of our mission, strive towards better health for all. And all is the magic word because it means that we should work across generations. That's sustainability. We should work across borders, international cooperation, across social divides, that's equity, and of course, across disciplines and sectors, given the complexity at hand. So, what are the basic concepts that I think we need to stick to when it comes to um, the major health challenges, and particularly in the field of international collaboration. I put up five different points which I think are so important when it comes to the challenges that we see today. One obvious thing is uh, interdisciplinarity. Health challenges as of today they are complex and they require interdisciplinarity. And I've listed some of the uh, different um, 
disciplines here. I was in Senegal not long time ago, and uh, of course, this was in the wake of uh, the Ebola infection or epidemic, and it's fascinating, of course, for a neuroscientist and someone who have been working in the field also partly in uh, anthropology to see how important it is and how important it was not only to have the medical knowledge but also to know culture, history, anthropology in order to succeed with diagnostics, vaccine and treatment. So again, I think that we have to be very, very attentive to the need for interdisciplinarity in research, healthcare, and in education. Persuasiveness of facts, what I think universities should be much better at is simply to provide political decision makers with the bare facts to ensure that uh, the political decision makers act on persuasive facts, not perhaps today or tomorrow, but eventually. I think we as universities have to be much more attentive to the need for dissemination of the research that we are doing. And uh, three issues here, which I think are also very important, and I will deal with these three issues later on in the end of this presentation. One issue that is very often forgotten is that if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals, some of them are synergistic. You can work towards one goal and you will also benefit from uh, reaching another goal, synergy between the different goals. But also the complexity is uh, again rather mind-boggling because we also now, out of the research that is being done, that uh, sometimes the different goals are in conflict with one another. If you try to reach one goal, you may remove yourself from another goal. And this is in fact a new research field. How do we ensure that we can work as efficiently as possible towards realizing the 17 sustainable development goals? We have to develop educational programs to better prepare tomorrow's leaders and citizens. I will be coming back to that as well. And we have to design new modes of international cooperation. These are the three issues that I will raise at the end of my lecture here. So first, I know that uh, also the Medieval Foundation has an interest, a keen interest and focus on children's health, child health. And here we see an example of the synergy and trade-offs between the different uh, sustainability development goals. It's quite clear that in order to improve child's health, you have to look not only into the uh, medicine, the biology, the disease mechanisms, but you have to couple as efficiently as possible the different sustainability development goals together. You have to look at poverty, you have to look at clean water, sanitation, education, all these different goals have to be uh, considered in order to really work efficiently towards uh, a better child's health. Develop education programs to better prepare tomorrow's leaders and citizens. What we're doing now at Karolinska Institute and many other universities do exactly the same thing is to uh, remodel the educational programs so as to do exactly this to ensure that candidates leave the university with this knowledge that you have to think and act across sectors to really improve health. We had a meeting at Karolinska Institute now in, in March. Helen Clark gave the keynote lecture, previous uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand, as you know, and head of uh, UNDP. And uh, 500 students were there taking part in this particular meeting. And uh, I'm sorry to say, but the students are far ahead of us when it comes to the understanding of the complexity and the importance of the Sustainable Development Goals. So I was a bit ashamed as the university president because I thought we were bringing in the students to make them enthusiastic about these goals, but uh, no way. They were already very well informed. And in fact, in many ways, we as teachers, we are lagging behind our own students. And this should not be allowed to happen. 
obviously. So this is from this uh, meeting, a lot of university leaders, but first and foremost, more than 500 students taking part, thinking creatively as to how we should flesh out a new educational program for tomorrow. So then the last point, which is perhaps the most important, and uh, which we are working on as we speak. How should we make our internationalization efforts even more sophisticated and more attuned to the uh, sustainable development goals and to the health challenges ahead? What we are trying to do at Karolinska Institute is to build what we call a virtual center for sustainable health, based on, among others, the following principles. I think it's quite clear that we have to take account of the fact that there is so much relevant and so much important innovative power outside of our universities. In resource pool settings, in rural areas, even in the Nordic countries, we see an innovative power that we should take into account when uh, handling, meeting the challenges in the uh, SDGs. We have to focus on reverse and symmetric innovation. We have to listen to the community voices. I was at a global health conference not a long time ago. Now there is scientific evidence, not really surprisingly, that uh, in international collaborations, if the first, last, or both the first and the last authors are from the particular area that is under investigation, that is being researched in terms of health challenges, the papers will have a higher impact than if the paper is, uh, has Karolinska Institute, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, as the last author, if we are dealing now with projects, for instance, in Africa. We have to be attentive to this. We have to focus on implementation. One of the research areas that I think is really under-focused, that's research on implementation. How do we implement diagnostics, new treatments, for instance, in resource pool settings? It's a research field of its own. And I think many times we are reinventing the wheel when we are implementing new diagnostics and treatments in different parts of the world, simply because we don't have a focus on implementation as a separate research field. We have to be attentive to the socioeconomic, commercial and political determinants of health when we engage in international collaborations. Biology, medicine, disease mechanisms are important, of course, but on top of this, we also have to uh, have a keen focus on these de determinants of health. Because, as I said I initially, very often our attempts to improve health are undermined by these particular determinants. We have to build comprehensive healthcare services. One of the problems with the Millennium Development Goals was obviously that uh, they were silos. So many organizations, they went for one particular disease, one particular vaccine, and perhaps forgetting that underneath you have to build a strong platform of comprehensive health services. And the, sec the last point, very importantly, given the health challenges that we have today, we have to forge new and perhaps surprising alliances. Bringing in industry, NGOs, local authorities, and of course universities and uh, scientists. So what we're doing now at Karolinska Institute is to try to live up to these principles in various ways. And of course, one extremely important thing is to marry, to the extent possible, sophisticated new technologies with medicine. So this is also a major effort of ours to, for instance, use artificial intelligence to uh, come up with uh, diagnostics, in, uh, even in areas that lack um, power, and that lack communication lines, so we have to depend on uh, cell phones and solar panels. And we have to emphasize prevention. 
one of the uh, interesting things that uh, came up uh, just a couple of years ago is, I believe, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. I mean, there are similar initiatives. We have COPID, we have others. But I think this line of thinking is so important to act proactively when it comes to not only infectious diseases, but, so but also non-infectious, non-communicable diseases. So in CEPI, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, as many of you might know, they are targeting 11 different uh, infectious agents that still haven't really uh, given that haven't really ended up in uh, serious epidemics. In order to generate vaccines before we have large-scale health emergencies based on these infections. In this way, an attempt is made to short-circuit the commercial determinants of health, to go for viruses and vaccines that still have no economic upside from the point of view of pharmaceutical companies. This, I think, is the way to act in the time to come. And we have to do so also when it comes to the NCDs to put much, much more effort into preventive measures. And this is uh, one of the major efforts we make now at Karolinska Institute to try to build on the knowledge we have when it comes to preventive measures for non-communicable diseases. Obesity, diabetes, uh, hypertension. Here we have a challenge that I think we can meet successfully if we work together. Just uh, an anecdote at the very end. Going again back to the Nobel Prizes. Last year, of course, you know that the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to um, Jim Allison and uh, Tasuko Honshu for their discovery of checkpoint inhibitors for cancer treatment. And uh, just after the um, Nobel Prize had been awarded in October last year. I went to Kyoto, and of course, there were all reasons to celebrate Dr. Honshu, Honshu, who is, as you know, from the University of Kyoto. But what happened when I came back to Sweden? The first thing I saw was a newspaper with this uh, headline, and I have translated it here. Nobel drugs kill hospital budget. That was the first, first headline I noticed when I came back to Sweden after having been in Kyoto. And this means that even in one of the most affluent societies in the world, Sweden, this is Salgenska, is a hospital in Gothenburg in Sweden, even one of the most affluent countries cannot keep up with the prices for some of the most potent medicines that we have. I know this has been a discussion in your community for quite some time, but certainly this is also an issue to be handled in other fields of medicine. If we go back again to uh, Martin Luther King, I think he would have seen pricing of drugs, evergreening of patents, this kind of thing, as a major threat when it comes to the, the future health. So the final slide. Complexity. Is enormous. As is very clear if you look at the sustainability development goals, our task must be to make this complexity inspiring for our teachers, students, and researchers. And I think we will manage if we really put this into our educational programs. And thank you for your attention.